Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. In the previous video in this series, I discussed the first word of Genesis, Bereshit, in the beginning. And though more can and will be said about it, in this video I will share some observations about the second word, namely bara. In English, the word order is different, for after in the beginning, the word God follows. But in Hebrew, it is the verb to create, as it is most commonly translated. First a little about grammar and typical word order. For in English, you put the subject, that is the actor, first, followed by the verb, and then the object, that is what is acted upon. So we get God, the subject, created, the verb, and the heaven and the earth, the objects being created. In Hebrew, a common way to construct a sentence is VSO, verb, subject, object, meaning you start with the verb, in this case created, followed by the subject, or the one doing the act of creating, here Elohim, God, followed by the object or objects that are created, the heaven and the earth. All that to say, there is nothing in Genesis 1 verse 1 that is strange or surprising with regard to word order. In Hebrew, verbs are also conjugated for person, first, second or third, gender, masculine or feminine, and number, singular or plural, based on the subject. In this case, bara is third person, masculine and singular, meaning we expect the subject to be grammatically he. As a side note, Hebrew, like Greek and Spanish and some other languages, does not always write out personal pronouns, so sometimes you are looking for a subject and it isn't there, in which case you may have to supply one in a translation, based on the form of the verb and the context, but this is almost never a problem. Lastly, we see that this verb is a perfect, also known as katal. This is a pretty common verb form and is often translated as a simple past. However, let us look a little closer at the perfect. For though it is commonly translated as a simple past, there are differing opinions about the precise meaning or value of the Hebrew perfect. Putting aside a few rare cases and rare usages of the perfect, the main use of the perfect is often seen as describing a completed aspect rather than past tense. What I mean by that is that often in Hebrew the perfect is used to describe that an action is completed as opposed to incomplete or ongoing, rather than that it happened in the past. In English we also have a perfect with a completed aspect, and it is formed by adding a form of the verb to have. Compare the simple past, I made, with perfect past, I had made. One is describing an action happening in the past, the other an action completed in the past. And the interesting thing is, that this completed aspect can be found in the present and future tenses as well. I make an action in the present, I have made in the present, the action is completed. I will make an action in the future, I will have made, the action will be completed in the future. Having said all that, since Hebrew does not have a simple past, the perfect can also be translated as a simple past depending on the rest of the sentence. In this sentence, for example, we already have a time indicator, in the beginning, making it more natural to translate with the simple past, created, rather than a perfect like has created. But the nuance is that the creative act, as described here, is finished. At least, if that interpretation of the Hebrew perfect is both generally correct and applicable in this sentence. In the previous video, I set out two possible ways to interpret the first word, or clause, namely as an independent or as a dependent clause. If independent, you would get the familiar, in the beginning God created. But if dependent, you might translate something like, when God began to create. The first, independent interpretation doesn't cause any immediate problems when you remember the completed aspect of the verb. The second dependent interpretation, however, will have to see the entire creation story of Genesis 1 as the completed action, like when God began, the now completed action of, creating, etc. Speaking of which, the same can be said for the independent interpretation as well. The action is completed by the end of the verse, or the whole chapter. A question that will come back at the first word of verse 2. Next, 
Let's look at the meaning of the verb bara. A traditional understanding of the verb bara is that it means to create, or more precisely, to create out of nothing, sometimes described with a fancy Latin term ex nihilo. Some observations support this interpretation, including the fact that in the Bible only God ever baras, and the fact that none of the verses where God baras is it ever mentioned from which pre-existing material God baras the final product. A second group of scholars don't think that bara means to create out of nothing, but simply to make. Though they may affirm that it is a special type of making that only God can do, there is nothing in Genesis 1 that obliges us to understand the verb as create out of nothing. Some arguments for this position can be found not much later. For example in Genesis 2 verse 2, the verb asa, to make, is used to describe what God has just finished meaning it is equally correct to say that God barat the heaven and the earth, and that God asat them. Another argument against the idea that bara intrinsically means to create out of nothing, is how the word is used in places like Isaiah 43 verse 15, which reads, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. The word creator is a participle form of the verb bara. And from the historical context, we know that God did not create Israel out of nothing, but from the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives. Meaning that even if no pre-existing material is mentioned, that does not mean it is absent. A similar argument could be made based on Psalm 51 and the famous line, Create, bara, in me a clean heart, which is then followed by a poetic parallel with the line, Renew a right spirit within me. So creating and renewing here refer to the same thing. And then there is the third opinion, which gained some popularity recently, and it is that the primary meaning of the verb bara is not related to the question whether or not there was any pre-existing material, but that it has to do with function giving or appointing rather than form giving. So God baraing isn't so much God going about and making or shaping things, either out of nothing or from pre-existing materials but about putting things in their proper place and giving them a function. And to be sure, there are several places, both in Genesis 1 and beyond, where God is giving a function to things or people, and by doing so, transforms them. One clear example is the lights in Genesis 1, the great light and the small light that God creates on the fourth day, after which he places them up high, with the function of illuminating the world by day and night respectively, and to function as a calendar. Clearly, this is God not just making the sun and the moon, but also giving them a function or appointing them to a position. In a similar way, it could be argued that God created the people of Israel by appointing them to become his covenant partners. However, despite the correct observation that function giving is certainly part of the divine act of creating and most if not all human acts of making, I am quite hesitant to limit it to this only, as some scholars want to do. This is in part because it doesn't just assume that God used a pre-existing material, but that God used pre-existing building blocks and entire objects. And much of this is inspired by the assumption that the ancient Israelites could not have had a concept for creating out of nothing because they had no thought category for nothing. This last assumption I personally find somewhat objectionable. It is true that an abstract philosophical concept of nothingness is quite sophisticated, but to preemptively rule out the possibility that a certain group of people could not have had this concept, either abstractly, metaphorically, or intuitively, strikes me as a little arrogant. Also the fact that in some cases, God used pre-existing materials to bara, as implied by context, does not mean that he does so every time. And the fact that the same object can be referred to as both barat, created, and asad, made, does not mean that there can be no meaningful distinction between the two. Both in Hebrew and English, the words do overlap a lot in meaning, but there will be very few theologians who would correct you if you said that God made the heaven and the earth instead of created. So in summary, bara is a finite verb, describing a completed action in the past. The meaning of bara is to create, a verb that has a lot of overlap with the verb to make, and it certainly includes the nuance of to give a function or to a point. But since only God is ever said to bara, it does mean that there is a divine nuance implicit in this verb.
and because of this divine nuance, and the absence of any explicitly mentioned pre-existing material, it is certainly possible that the verb here means created out of nothing, though that is in part dependent on how the rest of these two verses is understood. Stay tuned for the next video in this series to explore the meaning of the third word in the Bible, Elohim.